then Tuesday is New Year's Day. Anybody looking forward to good meals? About having family stuff planned with green and beans and all that fun stuff? Oh, oh I love it. We're going over to Erica's stepmom's mom's house for a traditional New Year's Day meal. I'm pretty excited about this. It's food. It's good food. But when we get to New Year's, we also think about resolutions, right? What we want to do this year that we didn't do the year before, or what we started last year that we did do. And we're going to look at some resolutions today and the difference between resolutions and vows and how not, why not to make a resolution a vow and the danger inherent in that. So, there's a couple of definitions in the bulletin. Uh, resolution is a firm decision to do or not to do something. Whereas an oath is a promise before God. But a vow is a promise made to God. We'll get resolutions more toward the end, but we're going to clarify what a vow is, and we won't spend much time with an oath today. So, the Old Testament gives us a lot of models for what happened, what how was, and what the consequences were. The first reference you see there, Numbers 30, verse 2 says, If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to buy his pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Deuteronomy, the reference there is very much along the same lines. For chapter 23, verse 21 through 23. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what is past your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised to do with your mouth. Which is emphasized the vows are not required, but when they are made, it is necessary to be kept, and to be kept in a timely manner. The Deuteronomy reference mentions that it is not a sin to refrain from vowing, but a sin is made and it is broken, that is definitely a sin. Leviticus emphasizes that further. This is a little bit of a lengthy passage, but the main point I'm getting to is verses 4 through 6, but I want to give you the context. So this is Leviticus 5, 1 through 6. If anyone sins in that he hears a public adjuration to testify, though he is a witness, whether he has seen or to come to know the matter, he does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. Or if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether a carcass of an unclean wild animal or a carcass of unclean livestock or a carcass of an unclean swarming thing, and it is hidden from him, and he has become unclean, and he realizes his, his guilt. Or, if he touches his uncleanness, of whatever sort the uncleanness may be, with which one becomes unclean, and it is hidden from him, when he comes to it, and realizes his guilt. Or, if anyone utters with the, his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear, and it is hidden from him, Realizes his guilt in any of these. When he realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as a compensation for the sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him and for his sin. Now, the big thing in that passage was even in the Old Testament, because all these vows are flying primarily to the nation of Israel to God's people in the Old Testament, right? And those who have adjoined themselves to them. God says, if someone makes a rash vow, even then, and realizes the mistake of, oh, that was not a proper vow, or I made that vow in error, there's an opportunity to repent, make offering, and be cleansed from the vow. Not just because, oh, I'm lazy and I don't want to do it, but I made that vow improperly. That was something that would not bring glory to God. I realize that now. I need to atone for it and make it right so that offer the sacrifice. Proverbs also talks about the rashness of making. Chapter 20, verse 25 says, It's rashly. It is holy. 
to reflect only after making vows. In other words, thinking that this is the right thing to do right on the spot without contemplating it. I swear I'm going to do this. And then realizing, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't the right thing to do. So that's what Proverbs is emphasizing there. That it is that will track. Now, going on to Ecclesiastes. When you vow, this is chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And it says, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow not pay. So the emphasizing there is on a couple of things. That when a vow was made, it was not something to be delayed in its execution, if at all possible. And the second was that if the vow was not going to be kept, it basically shouldn't have been made in the first place. Because you now have that weight of that oath you've made, or that vow you've made to God saying, I will do this. And you don't. As it was told earlier in the Old Testament, it's better not to make the vow yet, rather than continuing forward and just not doing it. Okay. There's one story in studying resolutions and vows I ran across, one historical account of a, one of the judges named Jephthah, and it can be found in Judges chapter 11, verses 30 through 40. It is really been in and Jephthah is trying to receive victory over the Amorites. So, we'll pick up at verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Amorites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return these from the Amorites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over the Amorites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Aror to the neighborhood of Mina, twenty cities as far as the great blow. So the Amites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came home, came to his home at Mizpah. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, for you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said, you Open your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Am Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone for two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughter went year by year, four days. Jephthah made a rash vow. Quickly, in order to get what he wanted. God gave him that, and then he encounters his daughter when he gets home. After he swore to sacrifice the first thing that came through his door. The Hebrew grammar there actually not only allowed for animal, but for person as well. So he was bound by his words. However, the Old Testament earlier in the, in the laws given to Moses, mentioned that child sacrifice was not to be done among the people of Israel. So Jephthah could have made repentance and atonement for his harsh vow, but he thought it better to carry through and therefore had to suffer the consequences of taking the life of his own daughter. So, being cautious with the promises we make, 
and what the consequences may be. Now, that's Old Testament. We talk about that applying to Israel. That has given us some models. The Old Testament shows that story of Jephthah particularly. The caution of making promises appropriately. Now, Jesus kind of breaks out a lot more bluntly. The New Testament model for a vast Matthew. 37. And what had happened in this time was in Jewish culture, vows had ended up being three different kinds. Binding, somewhat binding, and not binding. So that when they were argued in courts, they would know which one of these were more valid. The Pharisees and scribes had kind of taken these and twisted them in a way to where oh, vows when they were made could allow lot of ambiguity. In other words, where it was worded very, very, very wordily. So it could be twisted and tweaked as needed for whoever's advantage wanted it. More so than just being very straightforward. So, this is the culture in which Jesus was in at the time. And he says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Basically, that we should be straightforward as followers of Christ. Our yes should be a commitment and a word for us to honor. That we don't need to make an additional vow. And that the need to make an additional vow comes from sin in showing either our yes is not a strong enough commitment on its own. Or the fact that we feel we won't do it if we say yes and we need to make this additional vow. So that's what it means when it comes from evil. The vow itself may not be evil, but the motivation to make it, once you realize that yes should be enough of a commitment, that comes from evil. James 5.12 emphasizes that a little bit more. The epistle of Jesus' brother. When he says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. Essentially, if we make a vow or if we make a commitment, yes or no, and we don't keep it, we have broken the ninth commandment by bearing false witness as well, that we've promised to do something that we haven't. Now, if you study vows, you don't need to get into chapters 18 or 21, and you're mentioning that he took a vow, or that there are four people with him who took a vow, that goes back to the Nazarite vow mentioned in Numbers 6, where they grew their hair for a certain length of time. They came in camp with anything unclean. They had to shave their head for a set period of time. All this good stuff. It's more than likely that Paul and his companions with their group took this vow before they came to trust in Christ. But nevertheless, it was a vow they had made to God, so they kept it even though they had placed their trust in Christ. So if there's any ambiguity that's encountered there, that's the reason why. But marriage would be an, ex an exception and an ex vow. Because you take vows at your marriage ceremony to each other and to God together. Because God set that in place. That's acceptable. The commitment there is supposed to be If it gets broken, that's fine. God doesn't hold that against us. He hates divorce, but he still loves us. We make another commitment. We're still expected to keep that commitment, next marriage, so on. So just because one's broken doesn't mean we throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. Right? You know, God doesn't condemn us because we broke that one. But, but it's still, if we choose to make that vow again, that's something expected continued in the next marriage. Baptism, dedication, things like that. We usually make oaths where we proclaim before these people 
to raise our child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Or at baptism when someone goes down and up and they proclaim to follow Christ. Those are binding. Okay? But those will be acceptable, not just for something we want to do or that we feel needs to be done. So the New Testament tells us that we're not to make unnecessary vows. However, vows differ from, differ from resolutions. So we can make resolutions. The difference is, is as a resolution, we don't need to vow to God that we're going to do this and end up falling short because it puts us on dangerous ground. So we can resolve within ourselves that we will do something and make steps toward that. So in our resolutions, though, we have to filter everything through the gospel. How does this glorify Christ? Because it's really easy sometimes with our resolutions to be focused on ourselves. Like, if I think about the fact I want to drop 20 pounds, is it because I want to feel a lot more comfortable with my appearance and I want others to know how good I look? Or is it because I'm going to be more healthy to serve the kingdom? Everything has to come back to be filtered through the lens of the gospel. Um, if we hope for a promotion, is it because we still want the more money to spend on what we want for ourselves? Or is it because we want the opportunity to interact with new coworkers to share Christ and to have more resources for the kingdom? All these things fill through the lens of the gospel. Same thing with time for our family. Is it to get our family more involved in activities and play different sports if we want to spend more time with them? Or is it to actually spend more quality time with them together? Studying, reading, praying, sharing, living out life together. So we can make these commitments individually. There are other spiritual commitments we can make to read the Bible more, to memorize scripture, to strengthen our prayer life, to share our faith more, to increase our giving, etc. Now, one thing that I thought, I know a lot of people thought, um, I came on board halfway through the um, Read the Bible in 90 Days program, so I did not get to complete it, but I intend to read the Bible through this year and try to make that a yearly habit. Um, but it's really easy to get into thinking that's legalism if you're making that commitment and that's just something I've got to add to my checklist every day and I've got to do and all this other stuff. Well, it's not. And I had to do some research to assure myself of this and find out some words of some people a lot smarter than me who have been in the Word a lot longer than I have. Um, so this quote from John Piper gave a lot of clarity. Don't rest on past reading. Read your Bible more and more every year. Either whether you feel like reading it or not. And pray without ceasing that the joy return and pleasures increase. Three reasons this is not legalism. You are confessing your lack of desire is sin and pleading as a helpless child for the desire you long to have. Legalists don't cry like that. They strut. Second reason. You are reading out of desperation for the effects of this heavenly medicine. Bible reading is not a cure for a bad conscience. It's chemo for your cancer. Legalists feel better because the box is checked. Saints feel better when their blindness lifts and they see Jesus in the Word. Let's get real. We are desperately sick with worldliness, and only the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, can cure this terminal disease. Third reason. It is not legalism because only justified people can see the preciousness and power of the Word of God. Legalists trudge with their Bibles on the path toward justification. Saints sit down in the shade of the cross and plead for the blood of pleasures. At this point, Piper quotes another theologian, J.C. Ryle, when he says, Do not think you are getting no good from the Bible, merely because you do not see that good day by day. The greatest effects are by no means those which make the most noise and are most easily observed. The greatest effects are often silent, quiet, and hard to detect at the time they are being produced. Think of the influence of the moon upon the earth and of air upon the human lungs. Remember how silently the dew falls and how imperceptibly the grass grows. 
there may be far more doing than you think in your soul by your Bible reading. Now is a very eliminating quote for me to realize how much we need the word and it's not legalistic to jump in. Now, if we make a commitment to do something like read the word through the year, how do we keep such a spiritual resolution? We have proper motivation, such as realizing why we need to when we're reading. Such as when we talked about our desire for promotion, our desire for anything else, that it's filtered through the lens of the gospel, that that's our motivation, to bring more glory to Christ, not just simply that, oh, my life would be a little bit more comfortable if I had this. Because it gets for us to get lazy and be like, never mind, it's not worth it. I, I've started a gym in like January and quit March or April. Been there, done that, you know, because I had the wrong motivation. Okay? How to keep them? Accountability. Write down what goals you want for the year in your spiritual life, where you want to grow, how you want to get there. Put it somewhere you can see it. Stick a list to your mirror. Car, put it on your desk at work, put it on your phone, post it on Facebook so others can hold you accountable. Whatever works. Have them so they can be seen away and forgotten. Find someone to hold us accountable. David has been good since before I came on board. Um, we started an accountability relationship and we pretty much have permission to call each other on anything and be like, so what's going on? How's your reading? How's your walk? How's, you know, what's frustrating you? What's calling you to settle? You know, open up, share. Find somebody that you can trust to do that. Tell them what your goals are that you plan to read through the word or whatever this much, or you're working on bettering yourself physically to be able to better and you plan on going to the gym three times a week or you're going to start out walking ten minutes a day something specific share those goals with somebody who will hold you accountable okay and make it manageable don't get into something that's too huge to tackle break it down make it smaller okay like reading the Bible in 90 days starting January 1 would be would be daunting for me Walk through and you know when I can do chapters a day, I can handle that. Find a plan that will let you miss a day or two because it's going to happen. And don't beat yourself up when it happens. You move on, you pick it back up the next day, and you keep going. We're going to stumble. We're going to fall short. That's okay. We make allowances for it on the front end. And we know, hey, if this happens, this is not going to derail me. One bad day will not cause me to just to throw the whole thing out. Okay? If you're planning on growing and sharing your faith more, trying to make it start out, maybe it's one person, you know, one or two people a month where I work, I'll try to get the gospel too. Maybe this time I'll try to share with one week, two a week, if I can find the opportunity. So on. Build it up. Because if something's intimidating, Probably ever share my faith. I'm going to go share it with 20 people this month. It'll be hard. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't share our faith with as many people as possible. That's definitely the call. But at the same time, we grow in our confidence in our sharing, and we have to realize that it's not our ability that wins anybody to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit, right? Okay? Um, and giving. If you feel like, okay, this year I've given this much, but God has blessed me. And regardless of whether or not God's blessed me or given me more stuff, I want to give more. Okay? Make it a small chunk at first. What can I cut out? Or, or maybe I can not go out to eat one night a week. Or maybe I can get the start this, you know, these couple of days and give just a little bit more. Or maybe I, I've got some expendable income that I don't really have budgeted anywhere. Let me give it where it can be used. This all day. 
I'm glad that he's given us what he's given us. We don't deserve it. And I know sometimes I fall short as a steward. But I'm glad he's trusted us with what he's trusted us. So all these make it manageable. Find someone to hold you accountable. Have it written down where you can see it so you can grow, hopefully, in your walk with Christ, coming to know him through his word, through experience with him, through serving, and being better able to serve. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truths of your word, God. Thank you for helping us to realize, God, that we are human, that we fall short, but that your grace truly is enough, God. Help us to desire you. Help us to run full speed ahead, God, toward you. That we may be strong in our race, God. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom in the coming year of how to grow in our relationship with you, God. And we pray that you would give us the commitment and the resolve to carry through whatever you're calling us to do. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to commit another year to your service, God. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to be obedient servants, servants, God. That you would help us to bring glory to you, God. That you would use our church and our people here to reach friends, family, co-workers, God. Our area, this, this community, our county, God. All over the world group in India, God, that your glory would be made known, God. We pray, God, as we go into a new year, that you would continue to be with those for whom the holidays may be taxing. Thank you for being the great cover, God. We pray that as we go out from not forget what we've heard. We would not compartmentalize our lives with you, Father, your dear Son, but that that would be the focus of everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As for announcements,